All right, hello everyone. Sorry that we are about seven minutes late. I, if you attended the first session uh, of today in, well, this room completely open, then the person that was uh, speaking, he gave a really good tip on getting a timer right. right. So I was supposed to have about 40 minutes, I have about 30 now, but I'm just gonna start it now. All right, so welcome everyone to this session. The, if you are interested in the slides and everything I'm gonna talk about, you can scan the QR code or you can go to the, to the URL at the top. Um, it is a very scattered mirror board. Uh, I have a, co a couple of the presentations over there. I don't mind anyone seeing them. I don't mind anyone seeing uh, what I have over there. So if you wanna go in there, and grab it, then perfect. I'm wrong. Uh, this is the session of today. I am from the Dominican Republic, so I started making these slides and while I was at home. And uh, although I live in Sydney now, but um, that's a little bit about what we were supposed to talk about today. It was supposed to be getting started with feature stores, but then it just turned out that it was just going to be feature stores. It didn't really matter whether it was getting started or not. It was supposed to be a four hour workshop. There was a bit of a um, miscommunication in the schedule. And then um, we chatted and I asked him, you know what, let's leave it as a talk. So now we're here, it's going to be a talk. So I hope to keep you entertained for about half an hour uh, or so. All right, um, who am I? I'm currently a data science, uh, data scientist consultant and I do a bunch of things around data engineering and machine learning engineering as well, but I still go by the umbrella of data scientist. Whether the title is dying or not, that's uh, you know, up to whoever hires me to decide. And uh, so I work as an instructor at Decoded. I am now uh, an external um, uh, facilitator with them. I used to be a full-time senior product developer. I'm now focusing in two things, uh, being an instructor, developing content, and I also have a nonprofit organization in the Dominican that I'm building right now with a couple of friends, and that is what takes most of my time. Prior to that, uh, I was a data scientist and educator at Coder Academy in Sydney, which is where I'm based at. Uh, I was a research associate at NCI and I was a lead quantitative tutor at John Hopkins, Hopkins Carey Business School, along other things. Uh, in the personal side, I am a mountain biking addict. I don't have shorts today, but you will be able to see my war scars from, from all the very bad falls I've had. Uh, and then I am a coffee connoisseur wannabe, so I've, I've gone to quite a few coffee shops since I've been here in Ireland. I've only been here two days and I'm very, very, bless you, I'm very, very amazed at what I've seen. I really like this place, first time in Ireland. All right, so uh, what are we gonna cover today? So I hope um, that by the end of the session, you understand what feature stores are, why uh, do they matter, uh, how can you get started with them? I do have quite a bit of code since this is PyCon Ireland. Um, so we have to show some code and it was supposed to be a tutorial. So I will be very mad at myself if I didn't show any code on how to actually get the job done. And then at the end, I'm gonna uh, walk through a couple of concluding thoughts and I'm gonna show you some resources that I think are uh, top notch, much, much better than this presentation, but I'm very flattered that you decided to spend this 30 minutes with me. All right, so before we talk about feature stores, we actually need to talk about what the heck is the data science or the ML, um, the ML sort of workflow. What does it look like? Um, what, what do we do whenever we do ML? Well, we have some data. We know that we start with a question, and that question might be, uh, we need to predict something. We need to predict churn. We need to predict um, future sales. We need to predict uh, the item in an image, or um, we need to create a text generation um, model. We need to create something. We need to come up with something that takes past data, um, and then infer something about the future or predict something about the future. Inference and prediction is two different things, but they can be one and the same as well. So the code that goes in between the model and the data sometimes can be quite messy. If you, have, uh, if you are more on the data science side or on the data side rather than the developer side, uh, then you go to Kaggle and you feel at home. If you're more on the developer side and then you go to Kaggle, you feel like you just walk into a cemetery and you're like, what the heck happened here? Because the code can be quite disturbing sometimes. And, and, that, and that's a fact. And, but the fact of the matter is that it is a fantastic place to go and find uh, feature engineering techniques, to go and find really cool data sets. If you actually, um, you know, nowadays people are saying, oh, Kaggle is just about the model, it's just about the model, it's just about the model. But allow me to go in just a quick, in a quick tangent here. But if you actually want to create a use case and show it to an employer, um, you can, I bet you money, you can go to Kaggle and actually pick any data set at random 
and you will struggle to productionize uh, that model, or you will most likely struggle to productionize that model. Because what you will find are answers that take you, most of what, what I see when I go in is EDA, um, exploratory data analysis, some model building, but no logic behind the pipeline that is supposed to transform the data before it gets to the prediction part. And so when you try to piece those things together, yes, it's nice that the code is there, but picking it aside, I wonder which one is faster, you doing it yourself or you actually trying to um, go and put all the pieces of the puzzle together. But needless to say, you have a user, you have a model, the users are interfacing with that model. Um, hopefully you deploy it. If you're a pure data scientist, you might just create a model and then you uh, liaise with other people that might be able to put it into production. But usually there's some code over there that we don't want to look at sometimes. But then there is another process, a little bit more streamlined, a little bit more direct. You have all of the data. It has already been touched, thank God, by the data engineers. They have created an ETL pipeline and extract, transform, uh, load or extract, load and transform, you might be able to create your own transformation layer or you might be able to just query the data, do whatever you want and then make sure you write the logic down before you talk to a machine learning engineer or somebody else that can help you productionize the work. But the idea is that you have a data warehouse. That data warehouse has already, already has the data there, whether it has it formatted the way you want it or it just has it. At least you can just query one single place with different tables and start making joints and so forth. Then. Um, you use, you pick your favorite tool, um, you make sure you version the code, um, you make sure you create a model. You might be at this stage, if you are more from the data science, you're more uh, in between the data scientist and the machine learning engineer, you might, be able, you might be able to create your Docker containers, you might be able to create your Flask applications or your Fast API nowadays application, and you might be able to put it in a Lambda function, which only spins up if somebody's going to use it. The very first time it's going to spin up, it might take some time because that artifact is dormant, but either way, you get the point. You have your artifacts, they live somewhere, they come back, they give a prediction, your users are happy. So we have an idea now of the machine learning process at a very high level. This is not perfect. This is not every company. Um, this is just to put the thought in your head. So, and now we get to the, uh, to the core component of this talk what are feature stores, um, and what do we do with them. So if you think back, actually, let me read you the definition first um, that I put together. So a feature store is one of the components in a machine learning platform, and it allows teams of data professionals, um, notice here that I use data professionals because um, as you'll see later on, uh, the things that you can do with the data that you get from a feature store can actually be used for analytics just as much as machine learning and many other things. But a feature store is one of the components of the machine learning engineering platform, and it allows uh, teams of data professionals to define, transform, share, reuse, monitor, discover, and serve features on and offline. There's a lot to unpack over there, and we will unpack it um, here shortly throughout the presentation. But keep something in mind. Not all feature stores that are available right now um, as an um, open source um, piece of software allow you to um, do all of those things that I have described. As a matter of fact, the one that we will have a look at today doesn't do all those things. But in theory, the companies offering that solution today to organizations trying to do machine learning, especially uh, at large scale, they are offering most, if not uh, all of those solutions. So what do we have here? We have the services. The services, uh, we might have some data and uh, living in some storage. We might have images, we might have um, Text, um, uh, text data, we might have audio, we might have videos, we might have anything. They might leave, that might live in the storage, um, like S3, uh, Google Cloud Storage, uh, Azure Blob Storage and whatnot. We might have data warehouses with all the data completely clean. And then we might have streaming services where um, the transformation process has already taken place when data is coming in from applications or APIs or whatever is generating that data. So fees is not your transformation layer, but it is one of the components in that step. It is a feature store. And what it does is that it, it allows you to define what you want to take from the data that is coming in from different places and put it and you use it in your machine learning um, pipeline in two ways. One is historically, you are going to gather the data that has already been produced. You are not gathering something that hasn't happened yet. You're gathering everything that is sitting in one of those places and you're using it to create your model. 
In the second instance, you're going to have the model inference. So you're going to have the artifact that is making inferences. And why is that so, uh, why is that so important? The reason it is so important to have this component there, if you actually need a feature store, is because this person here, the client, is looking for another loan. Notice the keyword there, another loan. That means that this person has already searched for a loan, potentially at the same bank. This feature store has been deployed at a bank. And this customer applied two times this year for a loan. So if this customer is coming back again, and we already have data for these customers, they're gonna have new information. Credit score went up, credit card utilization went down, uh, a new loan account, a new credit account has been added to uh, its credit score, and so forth. That is new information. Old information, job, salary, age, um, and a bunch of other stuff that might not need to be put in a new in the form that this person is going to is going to need. So what happens is that this person is going to put new data in here, but then not all the data that this person has needs to be added, um, or needs to be, we don't need to bother this person in our user interface with uh, data that we already have in place. So what we do is that we get online data. Online data stands for um, data in, that you need in real time. Imagine if you create a, some sort of function that transforms some data that is in a numerical or it's a string and you want to make it into a numerical value or you want to make anything else into a numerical value, well, you have to create the logic, you have to attach it to the model and then you have to transform that data before it gets consumed by your model. But what happens is, if that data that we need here that this person doesn't need to put in lives in one of these places here, then that might take, that might increase the latency between our prediction and the decision we give, or our computation for the model, and the prediction we give to the user. And we want to reduce that. Because that might take, if it takes them 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, then they might just go to somewhere else to see what their credit is, or if they get the loan. We might lose that sale. We might lose that loan. So we're going to decompose what I just explained, because I know I went uh, through that quite fast. But, so now let's talk about what is Feast. So Feast, as they defined it, they define it in their website says, it is the leading open source feature store that automates the last mile in your production ML data pipelines. It allows data teams to serve features consistently for offline training and online inference. I, at the beginning, when I was first studying what, uh, what the heck feature stores are, uh, because they are some, a somewhat new term, I was like, why do I get so confused with the online and offline thing? Why can I just look at, okay, this is the, trader, the data that I need to train, and then this is the data that I might need that my application doesn't know or that the user doesn't know. Wouldn't that have been so much easier? But, but it, these are terms that are here to stay. So online inference means I have data that the user is going to give me for my model prediction, and I have data that the user doesn't know, but I still need. I have to go and look, at, uh, look that data up somewhere, but I don't want to go and compute it from a data warehouse. I want to have it somewhere available. And that highly available database might be Redis, might be uh, Cassandra, might be DynamoDB from AWS, might be something like that. So that's something that I want you to keep in mind before we actually decompose it here in a second. So um, to conclude that, Feast allows you to store, value, uh, to store features as definitions, um, register them, the definitions of the features, and serve the features online and offline. We will decompose what that is in a little bit. What Feast is not, it's not a data warehouse. It's not a compute layer. It's not a full-fledged uh, transformation layer. And it's not an ETL ELT tool. Um, so it is a form of gathering data in the moment that you need it for what you need it. And then it's sort of like ephemeral. Um, you grabbed it for the purpose that you needed. You didn't need to save it elsewhere and then increase the data usage or the gigabytes that your company is using. It's just a view into the data that you need. Bring it, use it, return it, or drop it. All right, so what is, that is what Feast is not. So I mentioned that we were, going to be talk, we were going to talk about what feature stores are, why they are important, and how do we get started about, uh, with them. So let's actually talk about, uh, before we talk about why they are important, let's talk about what Feast is composed of. At a high level, um, we have a feature repository. This is what you create when you get started with a, um, with a project. The feature repository is going to contain a couple of things. It might be a, um, URL to where your online database lives, if it lives in the cloud. But if you're testing, uh, your, if your development environment is locally, then you're gonna have that online store in your local computer. And that might be a SQL database, 
that might be a version of Redis, that might be whatever the heck you want to use, but it's going to be locally and it's going to be in that folder, in that directory called data. The second thing you're gonna have is the registry. The registry is going to have the definitions of your features, where do they live at, um, what cloud provider are you using, and any kind of detail whatsoever that you need. The YAML file, the feature store YAML file, is going to have whether you have an online store um, attached to, to this repository, whether you have a, um, the file that has, where is the file that has your feature definitions, where is the registry, uh, no, sorry, not the file with your feature definitions, where is the registry database with your feature definitions, and I believe the name of your, uh, the name of your repository, of your feature repo. And we'll see what that, mean, what that looks like in a second. So um, here are the same uh, things that I just walked you through. An online story, that is where the latest features uh, will live at. So another key component that I haven't mentioned is that when we think of the online store, we immediately think of time data. If we're trying to get the last time that a consumer came to our bank and grabbed a loan because we want to get their latest status on their credit history or sorry, their credit score or something like that, then that means that we have to have some sort of time component to it. So the online store is going to have most of the time, or by definition, it should have the latest, but you might want to have a different range of data to train your models or to, um, to evaluate your models. But usually we'll have the latest ones. Then you have the registry for the feature definitions. You have the, the feature store YAML with the information required for the infrastructure of your repo. And then the user SDK allows you to actually create a UI um, to spin up a UI that allows you to search for features, look at the data sets that you have created, but not the data itself, but the definitions and the things and the features that compose, uh, that, compose that data sets or those data sets. Um, notice that the UI is actually experimental right now in Feast, but um, it's actually pretty cool. It works very well, very minimalistic, minimalistic and um, I think it's a really, really useful tool. So, what concepts should you be aware of as you embark to create your first one, which we will see in a second. So feature views, as I mentioned, is this table that you create with features and they are composed of your features, your an entity and a timestamp. Time stamp. Why those three? Well, features, because you need them to be able to join a data set with one another. A entity that you're going to be using to combine one data set with another, with another, with another. And then a timestamp, because you might just want to have features from a particular time set or time range. Then you have the time, which is a mandatory component of Feast. So if you are trying to get started with Feast and you go and grab a data set from Kaggle or from anywhere because you're interested in creating a solution on a POC, then one of the things that you can do or one of the things that you will have to do is to add a new column with whatever time range you want to do. You can create a dummy time range from today or uh, to the length of the data set by days or by hours or by weeks and so forth. Then the next thing is that you're going to have the entity. It represents the linkage uh, feature between different feature views. Um, feature views, some feature views do not have to have an entity. So this is when I mentioned at the beginning that you might be able to use a feature store or that you can use a feature store to just do analytics. This is uh, what I meant with that, that you can, uh, you don't even need to link it to anywhere. You can just grab your data, the data that you need from um, data warehouse and off you go and do some analytics on it. The field are, um, is what a field is a feature, is the way Feast represents a feature. A file source is a pointer to where the data to be used is located at. If it's locally, you point to that file directory. If it's um, in somewhere else, you will have uh, particular classes that will allow you to connect to BigQuery, to Redshift, to Snowflake, and so forth. So any others? So there's a project that I mentioned. In the project, you have your feature views, your entities, your registry, your online store. The online stores, these are low latency key value databases that carry only specific features of, um, that are required for a prediction, usually the latest ones. Then there's one last component before we get to the why, and that is materialization. Materialization is what you do, or what FIS calls um, the process of adding to your online database the latest features that you need. So if we go back to the loan example, then this person comes in, I come in today, I need another loan, then I apply three weeks ago, but the features, the online feature store doesn't have that latest 
um, those, later, those values uh, loaded, then a materialization will load the latest values of me and other users that want to apply for a loan again in that time frame. Likewise, if you are interacting with a recommendation system, and one of the things that you need is not user input, but rather some calculated feature for the last week. For example, how many, uh, what was the genre that I viewed the most in the last seven days? Well, that, that will get the, uh, Netflix will get the mode of that. Um, how many times? What was the genre that I saw the most? And then it would update it into my online feature. And then that might be a value that will be useful in calculating what genre and what movie to recommend me next. So those are some of the key ways um, in which you use materialization. You add the newest values, not necessarily user-defined, but sometimes they're just a computation or aggregation of something that I've done. And then feature service is a fees class that allows you to tie specific feature views to a specific model. So if you think about version control and you think about version control of your models, a model can get very, very large, but um, also it can be completely detached to the data that was used to train it. But if you have a feature service, you can actually couple the, um, the data that you use at the point in time with the, and the definition of that data with the model that you create. All right, so why do feature stores matter? Well, ingesting features, this is the first, I'm gonna give you three reasons why they matter. Ingesting features that are unknown to the client in real time, this is the first reason why they matter. And the, probably the number one reason why you should adopt it if you want to adopt a feature store, if you don't have uh, that need of serving in real time information that the user doesn't have when you want to make a prediction for them, then it could be an overblown uh, solution for it. So on the right hand side, we have uh, a person saying, hey, here's my new data. Can I get a loan again, please? You have the bank app, you have the server model, and then you have data that is being um, that is streaming through, is going through a streaming application, it might be Kafka, it might be PopSoft, it might be Amazon Kinesis or so forth. Then you have data from the warehouse as well that might, we might be able to use it. So here's what I mentioned earlier. You have B1, things that the client did not change. For example, four might be the amount of credit uh, accounts that they have available. 75 might be the credit card utilization. Minus 10K it might be the actual value of loans minus the savings plus the whatever the person has, then things that the client cannot change might be interest rate uh, from the Federal Reserve Bank or whatever central bank of Europe here, and then other things. So those are things that the client cannot change and the client can change. This latest values will be loaded into the, into the online store, and then they will be combined with the values that the user can actually change, which are, well, now I have, um, I don't know, 10 something, I make now 60K as opposed to 55K. I have one car and I didn't before, so I have a new, or these are the number of credit accounts that the user might have. These are the things that the user can input again to get a loan and affect the decision of providing one or not. So then we have the data person creating a model. This person is going to create a model using the offline, offline store. The offline store has a, for that you will use the, uh, the function or the method of get historical features or get historical data and then for the online one you will use get online features you will pass whatever you need and then you will use you will send a request for the information the additional information that you need the feature store will provide you with a combination of the whole vector that you need to make a prediction which is really cool so this is in a nutshell if you actually need to use information that the user doesn't have or doesn't need to input again because you have the latest values of that and it hasn't changed then a feature store might make sense for you. The second, um, the second reason is because uh, of duplication of features. Well, no more. If you are using, if you have a team of data scientists and you have about 10 data scientists and you are building models using the same, uh, the same data or the same data sources, for example, one uh, data scientist might be, might be making a model on churn uh, prediction, another one might be making a lifetime value um, uh, the lifetime value of a customer and other one might be using something else and they are creating new data sets and new tables using the exact same values then maybe they can just get views to that data and all of them have the access to the same value to the same features and if they don't want to have the same features they can always create new ones and just add them to the repository that generates all of the feature bugs so duplication no more save some money then periodic this is this is the third 
um, option that is really, really important as to why, um, or that really makes the case as to why feature stores are important. If you have periodic retraining of hard to compute and frequently updated features, then a feature store might make sense for you. What are those? So for dynamic pricing predictions, so for example, uh, you might need for a dynamic pricing model, say for example, Uber um, or Uber Eats predicting uh, the price that is going to cost you to, not Uber Eats, sorry, uh, the price that is going to cost you to get a taxi at peak time versus non-peak time or to the airport uh, on a weekend versus to the airport on a weekday, that might be completely different value. So you might need um, the amount of active users at that time requesting a cab from the center of Dublin to the airport to be able to give a better pricing or a more competitive pricing to another user. And that is one example. Another one for ETA predictions, the number of drivers that are available uh, versus the amount of people requesting one. For song recommendations, so we might want the most listened uh, to genres in the last seven days uh, from your Spotify playlist to then whenever you click, I think the name of the button is Enhance, and then whenever you click Enhance, then it gives you a bunch of new songs alongside the, the list of songs that you have saved. I think that's pretty cool. So those are the three key reasons why you might adopt a feature store and why they are important. Um, in my view, there might be many more and you might have a different opinion and that's completely okay. So um, the last one, I actually have a fourth one. Ensure consistency across training and serving. This, this one is actually quite important as well. So there's actually four. So feature logic, your feature logic might be in Python. We all uh, do this, uh, most people nowadays do data science in Python. There's still quite a, quite a lot of people in R. R is an excellent language. Um, but then if you created the feature logic and you don't have the code that transforms or that grabs the features from a database that you need at a point in time to make a prediction, but the server side is actually built in Java or in Go, then you're going to have to create the definitions in those languages so that they can get the feature values that you need to make a prediction. So just imagine the headache if you don't know any of those two languages to having to go to a developer that writes Java and you tell him, I'm really cool. I Download, I imported scikit-learn and did fit predict. I need your help. I need to create a model and I need some data that I don't have access to. So then they will look at you and so forth and you know, it, it's not the most uh, effective process if you have two different uh, ways of doing things to accomplish the same result. And that's the last one that I'm gonna talk about. So now, how do we take advantage of them? Okay, so the first question that you might ask or that you might have is, well, do I want to build or do I want to buy? And for buy, you have quite a few services. You might want a fully integrated solution from the very, very beginning of creating ETL pipelines to deploying your models. So you might want to go with SageMaker, you might want to go with Vertex AI, which both have different versions of feature stores. Um, you might want to go with Tekton, which is a company created by, uh, by the creators of, or by some of them, core members of one of the first feature stores at Uber. Um, you have Hopsworks uh, that I believe they were talking, they were giving a talk today or yesterday. Um, they also have fantastic documentation, um, it's, but they have uh, for purchase version or a, a, an actual product and they also have an open source version. So then you have Databricks as well, which integrates heavily with Azure. So that's why I didn't put Azure here because when you go to their website, it actually sends you, they might have a version, I don't know it, but they send you to the one, to the version that is with Databricks. And then to build on top of, uh, you have Feast that we're talking about today. You have Feature Form that actually looks really cool and I haven't had a chance to play with it. You have Hopsworks um, as well. I haven't had a chance to use it either. And you have Feather. I just saw the video that um, LinkedIn released it uh, not too long ago. So those are some places. Um, some tools that you can do. But if you're here, you definitely wanna, you know, probably wanna build it or at least understand how to build it because you like Python. So let's talk through an example. So your task is to create a model that predicts who will repay a new loan. In addition, you will create a feature store to increase collaboration across teams in the organization. So you have your, say you have this folder on the, or this directory, on the left-hand side, you have your data, you have some descriptions, you have some raw data, you're gonna put your process data somewhere else, you have an interim data, whatever, and you have your models, your notebooks, read me, and then your source files, if you will create some sort of um, larger component 
and you want to modularize uh, your feature store or whatever service you create. So this is how the data, what the data looks like. Everything is connected. You might not be able to see it, but everything is connected by an ID between different, between different tables. But you have the application, at the time of application the, that the person came through, you have the application data, you have the bureau, so data from uh, the bureau of credit um, scores, the, the bureau balance, then the cash balance that the person has. If they have loans, what kind of payments are, are they paying right now? Their credit card balance, what's the utiliz their utilization uh, balance, previous applications, and so forth. So you have a lot of data from different places that you might need to combine, but you might not need to combine all of them. So this is a perfect use case for a feature store. So because I didn't want to use the code from, uh, I didn't want to use the code option from Miro, I actually did it in slides. So how do we do it? So first, you have fist init um, dash m for dash m for the name of your blank repository of feature store. This will give you a folder called feature store. Plus, inside of it, you will have the feature repository. Outside of the feature repository, you can have the files that create the definitions of your repo, of or of your entities and your views. But inside the feature repo, you are going to have everything else: the online store, the data, and so forth. So if you look underneath it, you're going to see that you have the project name. Um, the path to the registry, the provider is local. We can just change that and then send it to somewhere else if we have already um, created the configuration files for our cloud providers, for the cloud providers that we use. Then, oops. Then we're going to change, if we're going to do it locally, we're going to change the, um, the path to file to data for registry and online store DB. Then we're going to go and create a feature definitions.py file. We're going to add the libraries that we're going to need. And then we're going to add a couple of things. Remember that feast requires an entity. That entity is going to be the thing that we're going to use to join different tables together. And as you saw in the previous one, it was called SKID cur. So um, person ID current, each customer's ID. Then the next thing that we need is where the heck do those files live at? Where, if I create a view, where am I going to create a view, uh, that view from? So we have a file that is called credit card data frame that parquet. Remember that every file has to have a timestamp and the timestamp created in this file is called event timestamp. We can assign a name to that file source so that we can get it later in our feature repo and then off we go. So then the next step is the next step is to create the feature view. The feature view contains a name, credit card, entities, which is user ID, the thing that we defined earlier, the entity that is going to link all of the tables together. Remember, we might not need all of them to create a model, but we might. So um, I got about, what, two minutes left? Okay, two minutes left. So we have a time. How far, in, uh, how far back do we actually want to get data from? And then we have the schema. This is where it gets a little bit, um, it can get a little bit time consuming. If you have a lot of features, you're going to have to define them. But once you have them defined, they're there. You can do whatever you want with them. But you're going to have to define your features. Where is the source? Remember that we created the CC source for the credit card data. And then we can add tags. Um, and this is especially useful when we're using doing version control. So then we do fist apply. If you have used Terraform before, you have used the command uh, apply to apply your definitions to your cloud and create your infrastructure. So then um, this is going to give you an output of create entity and all of the stuff that you were trying to create and so forth. Then uh, lastly, you train your model. So how do you do that? So you instantiate a feature store um, variable. That feature store is going to allow you to get the historical data when you need to train data. And then you're going to call the features that you want in the same way in which you will call sort of a database. You put the name of the database or the name of the file, and then you put the name of the feature with a colon in between. You do the DF at the very end, and then you get a pandas data frame, if that's what you're going to use to create your model. Then you bring your model um, code as you would if you have done so. The one thing that you do need to keep in mind here is that Feast doesn't keep columns sorted. So you want to make sure you always sort it uh, as of right now, whenever you bring in some data from a feature view. And the reason for this is because you might be joining different data sets in different way, and then it's just not going to keep the logic of how it should be sorted, how the data should be sorted. So always sort it before you use it. And then off you go. Lastly, and last point of this is that the feature store um, 
is has the remember the incremental the materialized incremental means i want all of the values that i'm going to need for inference as they are up to date today as they are now if i don't want them for now then i might want to have them from today to 365 days back so whatever the latest values are in the last year give them to me so i use get online features and this is what i'm going to use alongside my application so that is the last piece of it. I have two more slides. I don't know if I have time for them, but you let me know. Um, so conclusion, you probably don't need a feature store, uh, which is ironic from uh, being in this talk, but there are other options. You might be able to use the transformation logic. You, might, you can put the transformation logic in, inside your model artifact. You might be able to use other options, include uh, using a transformation logic as a Docker container, as, a, as its own service. Think about it as a Lambda function or some sort of serverless function. And then whenever some data gets requested that you need, then you just send it through, bring it back, give it to your model, and your model can give out the prediction. But if you do, make sure the, um, there are use cases at your organization that could benefit from online serving. Um, duplication is costly. Periodic retraining on hard to compute or frequently updated features is complex and will benefit from incremental uh, interface. And lastly, there are some resources there. So that was the talk. So a lot of the things that you're talking about can be probably related to things that you would call data governance. And then there is this idea of having a data catalog that uh, sort of have all the information about the data. The problem with them is that usually they're useless until they're filled in. And as you said in uh, one of the last slides, like it gets fiddly before you actually enter the data, but then once it's there, it's useful. So would you say that if you don't cover everything with, like, if you don't have your features in the feature store, how usable is the feature store? It's like maybe like 10%, 20%. Is there like a general, your, your general opinion on that? Honestly, the first time I created, I've only created, I've, so I'm no expert. Let me start with that one in feature stores by any means. I've created two uh, for uh, two big projects, one for my organization and another one for uh, to teaching class. So I am no expert. And uh, honestly, I, I'll tell you the truth. I felt like it was a very bloated thing to put together. And also, bear in mind, I did it alone. I didn't really have anybody to bounce ideas off of. And uh, so that didn't really help. But once it was there, I did appreciate it. So even if it's 10%, I think it can incrementally fix uh, some technical debt in data science in particular uh, along the way. But honestly, if it's a small organization, especially if it's a, uh, an organization with one person doing that work, I just don't recommend it <laughs> as of right now. But great question. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you very much, everyone.